Well, hello everyone and welcome to Tui Snyder's Offbeat and Overlooked. This is episode 19, if you can believe it. And in Tui Snyder's Offbeat and Overlooked, in case you're new here, this is a weekly streaming show where I interview a variety of experts about cemetery symbols, forgotten history, folklore. Today we'll be talking about bizarre legends, churchyards, it's going to be so fun. Basically, anything that tickles my fancy. And as you know, I have a very ticklish fancy. Also, in case you're new here, I'm Tui Snyder. I write books. I give talks. I do a lot of research. And I love sharing what I find with you guys. Now, our guest this week, I'm super excited about David Castleton. Um, we're going to be talking about his brand new book, Strange Objects and Bizarre Legends. We'll be getting into that here shortly. Uh, of course, I have my usual, I have a few, you know, the usual little uh, um, introductions and a few little um, yeah, announcements to make. Uh, I like to remind you guys that I do have a recap and replay list over on, I need to update it, but I do have this over at my website. So if you just go to my website, which is just my name.com, you can go up here. I think it says show recaps and replays. And I, every week people ask me, or I get a message from somebody saying, hey, I missed your show. Sorry, how do I get to it? I keep the same link up forever. So the same link here will be the replay link. And I have a whole list on my website that kind of tells you the top 10 talking points. You know, you might go, oh, this one, sunken cemeteries or mermaids. Hey, I want to go to that one or gargoyles, you know, kind of lets you know. So you won't, don't have to miss out on any goodness if you don't want to. Now for our photo of the week, oh, and actually before I get to that, I just wanna say hi because I see Kenneth here and I haven't seen you for a while. So Ken's here from Colorado. Oh, Wayside Wade is here, whoop, whoop. We got Debbie up in Canada. Nicole, hi, Nicole. All right, the gang's all here. Sorry if I missed anybody. For some reason, it feels like it's been extra long since I, I did one of these shows. I don't know why. I'm just, I'm all excited, but good. You guys mix and mingle. Oh, Sharice, glad you could make it. Yeah, yay, all right, we got a good good gang here. All right, yeah, thank you guys, everyone who, who's here. I know you're just gonna love the topic tonight. But I thought for this week's photo of the week, remember how last week we were talking about mermaids quite a bit? And I mentioned that I saw a statue of the, the original, the Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. There's a replica of the statue that they have in Copenhagen in St. Thomas Virgin Islands. And back, you know, pre-pandemic when my hubby and I could actually travel, we were there, we saw this statue. And one thing that really caught my eye was how the original Little Mermaid is a little different anatomically than the Disney mermaids and the mermaids that we think of today. I mean, take a look at her flippers, folks. Do you see how her legs go down? Her flipperage flipperage <laughs> doesn't start up at her waist or immediately below her belly button. It's just that her feet have fins as if she were just a scuba diver. So that is quite different than how we tend to picture mermaids these days. And I just, I'm kind of wondering when that change happened. Um, I think Sharice mentioned that sirens have two flippers and mermaids have one. And I should have done my homework, but I didn't look into that. So Still, I thought that was kind of an interesting little thing. So that's our photo of the week. Of course, I always have a faux sponsor for the show each week. And I thought this week's sponsor would be Aquarina Springs, which is no longer in business. But this from the 1930s up until, gosh, I think the 90s or so, they had this tremendous, this wonderful, beautiful uh, underwater show with mermaids. Here's a picture of one. She's feeding some fish. And then in her right hand, she's holding a little breathing tube. So she'd be breathing and then feeding the fish and then doing all this cool mermaid sort of dancing. Doesn't I can't really see if she's got flippers. Looks like she's just got on regular swim attire there. So I thought I would share that. Um, and for our book of the week, I actually, I, I want to give my friends book a shout out to. Remember last week I told you about my friend Patricia Josephine, who I, well, Patricia Lynn, I've known her for over 10 years on Twitter. 
And she just, a dear friend, I forget that I've never met her in person because we communicate every day on email or Twitter, some sort of, of the interwebs magical ways. She's a wonderful writer. Her book that just came out is called A Quick Spell. And it is, as I was telling you guys last week, it's a collection of these stories and they're only 200 words long. And yet she manages to create memorable characters, have these really great O. Henry twists at the end. Uh, and they're really nice. I, I think it's fun because I, I have um, on my phone, I use the Kindle app. And so like if I'm at the doctor's office or something or you know just kind of stuck somewhere and have a few minutes, I will read one of her drabbles as they are called and it's a lot of fun. Now we have our other book of the week, of course, is from our guest. And I have a physical copy. I didn't think I was going to have it because Amazon told me it wasn't going to get here till June and I was a little bummed. But it, lo and behold, it arrived yesterday. I'm like, perfect. It's just in time for our show guest. So whoop, whoop. Very excited about that. We'll be getting into this. It's, it's um, And I have a link to this below. And you guys are going to love this because we're talking about, we have, we're going to, a ton of things to talk about today. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, David's book is chock full of really fascinating things. And I think it is right up your alley, you guys. You guys are going to love it. I want to see if anyone else has arrived. I realize I've just been babbling and not mingling at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, hey, everybody. What is this? She is different from the Danish one. Oh, really? So the Danish one uh, doesn't because that was supposedly the same statue, but I've not seen the official Danish one. So did the Danish Little Mermaid have a single flipper kind of thing? Well, now I'm all curious. I'll have to look into that <laughs> and find out. All right. So let me tell you a little more about our guests. I want to bring him on without babbling for too long. <laughs> um, let me get down here. I know I have his bio. Just a second here. Now, David Castleton, that is who we have for our show. And my friend Stephanie Quick told me about him. And then she she shared a link on Facebook to his blog. And then I, I checked out that blog post. And then like four hours later, I came up for air because I kept reading other things <laughs> so much and so many interesting things at his blog. Uh, you guys are going to have to um, check out his blog as well. I think I have a link in the description box below. I'll be sharing the link. To, and if anyone of you guys who are moderators feels like sharing it in the chat box, that would be great too. But he, David Castleton, is a prize winning author. He writes gothic, also magical realist fiction. Uh, he's an Amazon number one bestseller in nonfiction. He blogs about folklore, the dark, strange, and literary. And so today we are going to talk to him about his wonderful book, which you can see the cover there, Church Curiosities, Strange Objects and Bizarre Legends, and it does not disappoint. So let me bring him in and see how you do. How are you doing Hello. there? Hi, Hello. thank you. I'm okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. I know it's uh, probably, what is it, about 10.30 over where you are? Or? Um, it's about 10 past 10, yeah. 10 past 10. I'm feeling surprisingly awake, so. <laughs> oh, good. Maybe you're yeah. beaming some good, excited energy your way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I really appreciate you coming. I, yeah, of course, great I, to be here. I have to ask you, of course, yeah. the, the obvious question, which, you know, what led you, what inspired you to write this book? First of all, I love it. I got to say, I totally, this is a really wonderful mm -hmm. book, but I'm just curious now, how did you just go, I must make this into a book? What, what? tipped you into that um to, to be honest um it wasn't completely my idea um oh. i was um contacted by a guy called russell butcher who works mm -hmm. for um shire which is a, a division of um, bloomsbury publishers oh, okay and it was actually his idea so russell said oh i've had this idea for ages to do a book about weird and strange things in churches and um i think you might be the guy to write it <laughs> that's nice you know i Here's so, what happens to me. I get when people come up and ask me to write a book, it's usually like, oh, this one time I stubbed my toe. You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, I'm all like, really? Seriously, you, you should write that. I, I don't usually get the wonderful idea, you know, the wonderful idea handed to me, but that was nice. He realized you were a good fit and and you are. Yeah. So. I, I mean, uh, um, he followed me on Twitter. So I guess he saw the sort of stuff oh. I tweeted about. And I, I guess he maybe read some of the blog posts and, you know, yeah. it was a good book. That is actually, yeah. Twitter really can 
you know, when you tweet, it feels so private and personal and it mm. is a bunch of conversations, but people are watching and I have had people oh, yes. reach out to me sometimes. I'm like, mm. it feels good. And then later on, but that means they're watching me, <laughs> yeah. you know, because you, you sort of forget you're being watched. It's like when you're on camera for a while, you forget the camera's there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's really great. All right. Well, you know what I did was I just stole a bunch of photos from your book and uh, just wanted to ask you, put you on sure, the spot yeah. and go, let's play mm -hmm. show. Uh, so I just kind of went through it and, you know, we might not get to them all, but I mean, I, there were so many fascinating things. And I do want to reiterate to everyone that even though we're talking about tons of things, you're going to be surprised because there's so much more into it. So you've talked about the standing stones, runes mm -hmm. and pagan altars. And I love this photo and just wondered if a little bit of it. Yeah, so uh, this is a statue called uh, La Grande Mère, uh, uh, which means uh, the grandmother. It's actually in Guernsey, so it's a, a French name. Uh, yeah. In case anyone doesn't know, Guernsey's, it's an island like just off the coast of France, but it's actually part of Britain. Um, and um, she's like a Neolithic um, statue who stands just outside St. Martin's Churchyard on Guernsey. And... Um, she um, she probably got reworked in the Roman period between about 100 BC and 100 AD, but she's like from a Neolithic time. She's really ancient. Isn't and, that something? Um, yeah, and she, there's um, a lot of kind of local um, folklore connected with this statue. So um, people leave like coins on her head and things like this and flowers around her. And um, apparently she's very popular in wedding photos. Oh, that's great. Yeah I, yeah, I wouldn't mind having her in a wedding photo. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, well, and she was actually um, a, a pious church warden in about 1860, actually ordered that she should be destroyed. Oh. And um, so she was broken in half, but oh my the, lo gosh. the local people were so fond of her, they actually had her repaired with cement, and she's still standing there with just what? a sort of bit of a bit of a crack in her um, stone. But um, But yeah. She's still well, thank there. goodness. Yeah, she's looking yeah. good. <laughs> wow. Now, I absolutely love this. This is interesting. Yeah. It's just like, wow. I mean, that's old. <laughs> Can you tell yeah. us a bit about this standing zone? Uh, yeah, that's the um, Rudstone monolith. So mm -hmm. it's actually Britain's tallest standing stone. Oh, all and right. It, it stands in um, a churchyard in a village called uh, Rudstone in Yorkshire, in the mm -hmm. north of England. And um, it uh, weighs about 40 tons, apparently. Wow. Yeah, you wouldn't want that to um, fall on you. No, no, and there's there's all kinds of weird legends connected with it. Like um, some people say the the devil um, hurled it at the church, but it was oh. deflected by divine intervention, and it just kind of fell in the churchyard. Wow. Other people say it dropped from the clouds one day and squashed some sinners who were desecrating the churchyard. So. Um, there's lots of weird <laughs> legends about how it got there. <laughs> That's interesting. I like the one of yeah. it just falling and squashing some naughty yeah. people. <laughs> that, that might actually be connected to um, a meteorite apparently fell nearby. Oh, okay, and, so it's nice I mean, when you can figure out how yeah, that might have been, how the legit legend might have grown. Yeah, I mean, it's not a meteorite, but the two things might have kind of merged. They conflated, and yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I find that a lot just doing historic research, how maybe there's two true stories, two true crimes mm. that happened even not that long ago, maybe 56 years ago. And then the locals just merge the story together. And then you can't, yeah. you know, you, you can pull it apart and they're two interesting stories, but I just, what humans like to do with the, it's yeah. like we, we sort of cut and paste all the cool things that happen and they make a new story sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we all do it. Uh, yeah. I, I don't even, this is beautiful. <laughs> yep. So that's um, an Iron Age hill fort called um, Aldorum. And um, during the Middle Ages, it actually contained um, a cathedral. You can just oh. see the, the kind of outline of it. This? And it, that's right, yeah. yeah and it also right. contained a, a castle on mm -hmm. that bit in the middle. And mm. there's a city, a whole city all around it. And wow. um, what, what eventually happened was... Um, there were complaints about like scarcity of water and the, the rage of the wind. And yeah. they actually um, like rebuilt the cathedral in nearby Salisbury. They sort of took, oh. that, took it apart brick by brick and shifted it a little way to, um, to Salisbury and built it up again. Um, well, just think that, I mean, that's a tremendous undertaking. <laughs> just yeah, to, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
I mean, even when they do that with houses nowadays and they move it, the house, yeah. it's a big deal. But I mean, to have done that with a cathedral, goodness. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Man, that's really neat. Well, it's beautiful looking. Oh, this was one of my favorite photos in your book. Mm -hmm. That if, if I were just to glance at that, I think it was like a Celtic cross, but there's not. There's so much more to it. Yeah, it's actually um, it's no called more? the Gosworth uh, Cross in oh. Cumbria, in the northwest of England. So it's actually got a lot of um, Norse um, carvings on it. So it's like a mixture of Christian motifs and things from Norse legend. Wow. Um, so it's got carvings of Lochion, for example. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, Thor, the god Thor. Yeah. Uh, the sort so of cool. world, world encircling sea serpent of Norse myth is on there. And um, apparently towards the, the bottom, it looks a bit like wood, which might come from um, the the idea of a Norse um, cosmic ash tree that supports like yeah, the whole Yeah, like the tree of life thingy. Yeah. Or their version, I guess. Yeah. Yes. So so they think they hmm. might have like mingled these. It dates to about 900 AD, so it's pretty old. Yeah. Um, they, they think they might have mingled these like Norse mythological scenes with Christian motifs. To kind that of is and, um, really interesting. I, I was not aware yeah. of Nordic and Christian yeah. commingling like that. But it's that very unusual, cool. but mm -hmm. they, they might have been doing it to aid like conversions to try and convert sure. like, to Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Francisca wonders if there were people buried within the circle. I think she's referring back to this one. To be honest, I don't know. I suspect there, there might well be, um, as a mm -hmm. cathedral was there and it was a whole yeah. city. So it wouldn't surprise me. But I, yeah. I can't say I know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All mm. right. But yeah, that one just, that really captured my imagination because I just, I yeah. don't know, I hadn't heard of Nordic uh, and Christian mix. I just thought that was really I, cool. I think it's kind of unusual. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it's definitely something I would love to see. Oh, oh this is fun. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Had to bring this up. And I have something for show and tell along these lines because it made me realize something. So go ahead. Yeah, that's um, called a shield and a gig. Mm -hmm. So uh, the shield and a gig is, as you can see, it's a sort of depiction of a, a woman. Mm -hmm. And she's... Uh, Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> enthusiastically pulling open a certain part of her anatomy, shall we say. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, these are found um, throughout uh, Britain and Ireland. There's actually more in Ireland, but we have quite a few in, in the UK as well. And um, there are all there kinds are all of ideas kinds of about... Um, what, what it might be or where it might have come from. So some people claim it's like a, a pagan goddess who somehow sneaked into the, the new religion's houses of worship. Um, other people think it might be a warning against uh, lust. So it's uh, telling people not to be lustful. She looks um, pretty happy, though. <laughs> she looks quite happy, that's true, yeah. Some people think it might be a kind of guardian to um, scare away demons and things like this. Yeah. Um, but I think there are about 45 um, recorded Sheila and the gigs in Britain and wow. maybe about 100 in Ireland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When I, I uh, went to newspapers.com and typed Sheila and the gig in, mm. in just to see if, uh, what I could find. And a lot came up for Ireland and a yeah. lot of uh, topics of, you know, schoolboys tittering at this. <laughs> kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And, and, um, <laughs> and then some people where they had... Uh, arrange something to cover their lower half like like i don't yeah, know maybe yeah. a little skirt uh, uh, apparently <laughs> some have been like torn from churches by priests or outraged uh, parishioners <laughs> um yikes yeah. <laughs> we don't have to answer that one oh we i know i know <laughs> <laughs> quite possibly <laughs> yes yes well here's yeah. the thing that i had a little epiphany um i remembered that okay i love tiki bars we uh, my husband is building a little tiki hut in our backyard and I just love that whole thing and I, I took Polynesian dance growing up and uh there's a really great tiki bar down in Florida this really does relate eventually I'm not just going off my rock right mm -hmm. here and uh so we had our picture taken out in their back area and this was their uh one of their mm. like things they had and I realized oh it's it's almost Kinda like a similar, Polynesian yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thing. and then uh I bought okay I bought here's my show and tell item so I bought a, um, you know, a tiki drink with the fufu mm. umbrella in it and everything. And I don't know if you can see, but she also is a little bit yeah. uh, along those lines. And so now I'm curious because I, 
it's not something they brought up in my Polynesian dance class or anything. Mm. And so I just was like, and then she went a gig. I didn't, you know, I always thought of that as just a European thing. And I thought, well, maybe there's some yeah. sacred feminine Polynesian yeah. thingy it's, from now on. It's, well. um, it's very, very similar. Um, I, I, I had no yeah. idea that there was a, a kind of Polynesian equivalent. Um, oh, it's only taken me decades yeah. to connect that dot. Yeah. <laughs> well thank you and all thanks to your book people you need to read yeah. this book it's going to be revelatory yeah. <laughs> okay so anyway that was sort of funny uh so yeah and then you, you go into this is a very fun chapter because mm. i love skulls i mean i'm drinking yeah. my iced tea out of a little glass skull right now <laughs> strange remains and weird repositories mm. and so you've got some really good ones in here such as like what's this guy <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that guy is um, Simon of Sudbury. So he was um, an archbishop. Wow. And um, he, um, during jo his reign as Archbishop of Canterbury, which is like the, the boss of the Anglican mm -hmm. Church. Uh, so uh, during his reign, um, there was like a, a revolt of uh, peasants because he, um, he was also Lord Chancellor of uh, England, which means he was basically in charge of the, the money kind of side of the government. And he imposed a poll tax, um, which I think may be a mistake. You refer to that as a flat tax, so everyone has to oh, pay the same. Oh, got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, um, mm -hmm. so all the peasantry were suddenly saddled with this oh, um, hefty yeah. tax, Not and they mm -hmm. um, they they revolted. And um, peasants from Kent and Essex kind of invaded London, found mm. um, Simon, and uh, they they chopped his head off. Oof. And uh, it was displayed on a spike on London Bridge, which is the traditional uh, fate for the heads of traitors. Wow. Um, the, the Peasants' Revolt was eventually crushed. And um, so I'm, the, the leader of the revolt's head was uh, put on the very spike which had skewered Simon's head. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, some of Simon's friends had actually managed to take his head down and they'd taken it back to Sudbury, where Simon was from. Oh. Uh, but... Uh, after the revolt had been crushed, they in London they could find Simon's body, but they couldn't find his head. So oh. his body was actually buried in Canterbury in a lavish mm -hmm. funeral with wow. a cannonball as a substitute for the head. Really? And the, and the head remained in Sudbury, and it's still there today. <laughs> and oh, it's interesting in this, um, that they thought, well, we'll, we'll just yeah. put a head there. I wonder if they put a little wig on it or anything. I mean, that's just <laughs> yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's still there in St. Gregory's Church in a small oh. town called Sudbury in, in Suffolk in the east of England, and mm -hmm. it's in this little cupboard. Uh, but I think if you want to see it, you've got to kind of make an appointment. It's not just on, on display to everybody. Oh, okay. But um, I think there's a, a painting of what Simon would have looked like in the mm. church. They kind of reconstructed him uh, by by examining the skull. So oh, you can yeah. see see what he would have looked like. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, yeah. the things people would keep back then, they didn't had a different sense of maybe what was macabre and what wasn't. Yeah. Uh, well, it's kind of a relic of, in a way, I guess. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't think he was made a saint, but it's kind of kind of a relic yeah but people revered him a bit yeah 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 well, yeah well there's his head that's all we've got <laughs> yeah <laughs> well now and then we've got this hand yeah <laughs> that's really something is yep. that where people can see it or what's the story well that's apparently the hand of um saint james um the apostle oh um so it's um so if that's true it's it's of a hand of a very famous person yeah. Um, so um, I think it was um, originally kept in Venice, but it was presented mm -hmm. uh, to an English king because, uh, as part of his like, what he got when he married his wife. Uh, oh, a bit of a dowry. You know, oh, I'm sort here. Of dowry sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, it was kept in. Um, I think it was read in Abbey in kind of mm -hmm. Berkshire, southeast England, and it was famous for kind of curing people's ailments. So people would come along to the the abbey, and the monks would like touch them with a hand, and wow. sometimes it would apparently cure their diseases and things mm -hmm. like this. Um, but come the dissolution of the monasteries, uh, when Henry VIII um, abolished the monasteries, the monks mm -hmm. actually put it in a chest, and they they hid it in the wall of of uh, Reading Abbey. Oh, and it wasn't found until years later, when wow. part of the the abbey was being demolished uh, to make uh, Reading Jail. Which is Ooh. actually the jail where Oscar Wilde was sent. Oh, really? And, um, yeah. Oh. So, so they, they found it in the walls when they were building the jail, 
mm-hmm. and I think it um, went to, I think, a museum. Mm-hmm. Then when that museum closed, it went to a private collector. Oh. And when he died, he left it in his will to a church in a nearby town called Marlow. So St. Peter's Catholic Church in Marlow. Mm-hmm. And um, and apparently, if, if you want to see it, you've got to, like, contact the church and make an appointment. It's not just on display. but um, Oh, all right. I think I think if you really wanted to, you would be able to take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. If you just know yeah. who to ask, you know it's there. Yeah, yeah it's quite yeah. interesting. I was wondering, yeah, because this this photo looks very official, like it's in a museum, but that's a very well traveled yeah. uh, relic. And they they do yeah. when you read about relics, it they are so often stolen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like the, the most, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, very very fascinating. Let's see what do we have next? Oh, we yeah, have this. I thought this was interesting. Another famous head, yeah. Yes. Right, well, Oliver Cromwell, um, um, you you know the kind of history, Oliver Cromwell, like, rebelled against the King of England and had his head chopped off. And then um, after Cromwell died, the King's son got restored and the monarchy got restored. So um, it was Charles I who had his head chopped off. Charles II, his son, was restored in about 1660. And um, Charles II wanted to take revenge on Oliver Cromwell for overthrowing his dad and cutting his dad's head off. Uh, the only problem was that Oliver Cromwell was already dead. Yeah, how so do you how do, do that? How do you take revenge <laughs> on a dead man? Well, um, he had Cromwell's embalmed body dug up from uh, Westminster Abbey, oh, paraded my. through the streets, mm-hmm. um, hung, hung on a public gallows. What? Um, so they were like hanging the guy, even though mm-hmm. he was dead. Yeah. Then they chopped his head off and displayed his head on Westminster Hall, which is like um, a hall um, sort of near our parliament building. Man. So Cromwell's head was displayed in Westminster Hall until I think about 1680 when it got blown down in a storm. And, that was a long um, time. A guard, uh, a guard stole it and hid it in the chimney of his house. Oh, <laughs> I think the guard wanted to sell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, it passed have- through oh, like various owners over the years. So mm-hmm. there were like entrepreneurs who showed it in like freak shows, which is the sort of you yeah. know advertisement you can see here. Mm-hmm. There was a, a drunken. Comic I know. I love actor. this. This would be a great yeah. poster for the wall or something. Yeah. It's just so, yeah. Yeah. It's just so <laughs> like wow. Other times, there was, um, you know, there was a drunken comic actor who liked to pass it around at his parties. He'd like oh, get the charming. head out and mm-hmm. kind of pass it around all his guests. Um, <laughs> and eventually, um, the last owner of the head. This was like nearly into the nineteen sixties. Mm-hmm. He decided that um, it would be the decent thing to actually have the head buried. So he contacted Cromwell's old um, college, which was um, Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge, uh-huh. and they they arranged for the head to be buried in their chapel. So, wow. um, so it was like a plaque today marking where the, the head was buried in 1960. Yeah, yeah. very well traveled. I thought that hand got around, but the head sounds like the head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it had quite a few adventures. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness! Well, now it's been very. Yeah. Uh, this was very sweet. Of course, we all love yep. pets. <laughs> So you tell us about this terrier. <laughs> yeah, so this is Edinburgh um, in Scotland, and uh, it's a dog um, called uh, Greyfriars Bobby. Um, so Bobby was a Sky Terrier, uh, quite a small dog, and he was a dog of a, a night watchman. So this man was in the police force, and he used to patrol Edinburgh, and the, the dog kind of tagged along with him, and they were very, very close. But this night watchman died, um, when the dog was, I think, about um, four years old. And he was buried in a, a churchyard called Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh. It's a very famous mm-hmm. uh, churchyard. And uh, the dog, according to legend, wouldn't leave his grave. Yeah, so, that happens. Uh, so it guarded the guy's grave for 12 years. Oh, my. Mm-hmm. According to legend, the reality yeah. is maybe slightly different but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and the dog became quite famous people would come and see see it guarding the guy's grave and um there's like a gun which is fired at one o'clock from nearby edinburgh castle mm-hmm. and the dog used to take that as a signal to run to a nearby cafe where they'd give it a, a sandwich for lunch oh he had it, it going he on was, <laughs> it was quite a famous dog um mm-hmm. and when he died at the age of 16 uh the year after so he died in 1872, I think. In 1873, this um, sculpture was put up. And um, it was by quite a famous uh, sculptor at the time. 
Um, and um, it was actually topping a water fountain with, um, you know, fountains for both humans and dogs. Oh, okay. And uh, that gravestone, you can see in the picture, that was put up in 1981. Um, oh, that's very still, recent. You can see people leave, like, sticks on it and sometimes, like, dog toys and dog mm -hmm. treats. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, um, this little dog, it did actually kind of hang out in this graveyard. Oh. Although not not all the time. Apparently, on like colder nights, it like went into local houses for shelter and things. Oh, like good. That. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it did, it did sort of hang out there, and people knew about it, and it became quite uh, quite famous. I like the bit yeah. about it, it knowing when it could go get a sandwich. Yeah, you know, yeah. our dogs they they train us pretty well. These dogs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really cute cute uh, sculpture. I mean, it's weathered yeah. well. There was a guy it. called Graham Brody who was one mm -hmm. of the like top. Um, sculptors of the time. So, oh, okay. Yeah, it's quite a impressive monument. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I haven't been to Edinburgh, but I'd, I'd love. Well, to you've go. got to go. Edinburgh's I, wonderful. It's, I've got to go. I've got to go. Found some fantastic graveyards as well. Yeah, I read a lot yeah. about them, and oh, so much history there. Yeah. So, yeah, one of these days it'll happen. Well, you have another section about giants' graves, odd mm -hmm. epitaphs. You have some really fantastic epitaphs, but folks, you're gonna you can't read them all. You're gonna have to check out his book. Resurrection Man, of course, speaking of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. But um, let's see here. I, I did like this story. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a grave of um, a lady called Hannah uh, Tornoy, if I'm pronouncing that right. And um, she's got the um, unusual distinction of being the first person in Britain to be killed by a tiger. So, um, yeah, which is crazy. You would not have yeah. expected this. In that no, time. <laughs> not a usual way to die. So, um, Hannah was actually a barmaid, and um, one day a traveling menagerie showed up in the, the courtyard of her tavern, and uh, it contained a tiger. And Hannah couldn't resist um, teasing this tiger, uh, which unfortunately had fatal consequences because yeah. uh, the tiger killed her. And uh, this rhyme uh, you can see there was uh, written on her, her gravestone. So uh, do you want me to read the rhyme out? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in bloom of life, she snatched from hence. She had not room to make defence. For tiger fierce took life away, and here she lies in a bed of clay until the resurrection day. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's in um, Malmesbury Abbey in, in Wiltshire. You can see that gravestone. Yeah, that, that's really yeah. neat. And what a way, what a story. And I love it when an epitaph actually tells you something about the person. And this one, I'd be like, tiger? Yeah. What? I would be, <laughs> if I didn't know the story, I'd be thinking, are they being like symbolic? I mean, you know, the tiger of an illness, you know, like yeah. you know, it could be a real tiger, but no, a tiger. That is really yeah. interesting. I thought that was interesting. And, and Francisca's reminding me that there are beautiful graveyards and cemeteries I've seen. I know, I know, must must travel, must travel. It'll happen. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh yeah, this one was interesting. Yep. Um, do I have, is this the same one? Nope, 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 this is no, the, okay. This is yeah. just an epitaph that I liked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, so um, in England, there are a few um, uh, churchyards which contain graves of African slaves. I was surprised because um, I don't associate slavery with Britain, you know. <laughs> no, um, so so we didn't have many um, African slaves in Britain itself. They tended to be in colonies like the West Indies, but mm -hmm. there were a few like aristocrats and rich people who brought over oh. um, like African. Well, they were called servants, but they were probably slaves, basically. Yeah. And um, sometimes when these slaves died, um, they'd be like given a, a gravestone with an epitaph and um, there are quite yeah. a few of them around uh, the country um I, this was eye-opening as i was going yeah. through your book i was like i just didn't know that and then you know here they are master and slave next to each other i like how they're pointing out you know yeah, so this was a mm -hmm. this was a guy who um had a a slave from mozambique i think and oh when he died he he asked for his slave should be buried with him and mm -hmm. when the slave died about Seven years later, he he was buried with him, and um, that's the that's the epitaph on the grave. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Like I said, you you really collected some great epitaphs in your yeah. book, and um and this one I love because it's like I mean you know a little snarky I guess they're like... yeah very snarky yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> like wow because people want to yeah. be buried in the church you know that's like all this yeah. magic. I'll let you explain go ahead. 
Yeah, so so this guy, um, he obviously couldn't afford to be buried in the church. He had to be at the, the door. Um, so he asked that this rhyme should be um, put on his, his gravestone. So um, here I lie at chancel door. Here I lie because I'm poor. The further in, the more you pay. Here I lie as warm as day. That is great. I mean, he's like, yeah. you know, yeah, so it's really something very interesting. And, you know, the fact that they went ahead and let that rhyme through, because, I mean, I've heard of some cemeteries turning down um, okay. epitaphs in modern times that aren't yeah. even as pointed. You know, they're like, well, we don't know. Yeah. You know there's that. So I thought that was great. It was just a little bit pointing out something important, mm. <laughs> I'd say. Okay, I am a sucker for pyramids. I love that you yeah. included some pyramid uh, <laughs> graves. Oh, here's someone saying awesome. Yeah, isn't that awesome? I thought so. That was a great mm -hmm. epitaph. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I like this one with all the sheep around it and everything. And <laughs> who yeah. do we have here? <laughs> What's the story? Um, yeah, that's um, that's the tomb of a guy called um, John Madjack Fuller. So he was this very eccentric um, landowner, and he was a, a conservative MP as well, like member of parliament. Um, and um, he built lots of weird follies on his estate. There's, oh. there's quite a lot of bizarre constructions, but maybe the most bizarre one is his tomb. Um, <laughs> as you can see, it's in the shape of a pyramid. And uh, that was actually, um, um, I wouldn't maybe say popular, but it was kind of fashionable if you could afford yeah. that sort of thing um, to, to have... Um, you know, a sort of little pyramid for your tomb. There's quite a few mm -hmm. scattered around the country. I've actually got a post on my blog about some of these uh, pyramid tombs. Oh, yeah, and, everybody, you need to check out his blog. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, this guy, Majak Fuller, legend says mm -hmm. that he's interred in his mausoleum sitting up at a table. Oh, ooh. And the table's set with a, a roast chicken and a bottle of port because uh, during life, Jack was very fond of his food and drink. And um, <laughs> and um, so so the the idea was that when he awoke at the resurrection day, um, he wouldn't be hungry or thirsty because he'd have this chicken and a bottle of port. You know, that's set out for him. Yeah. <laughs> Another legend says the floor of a mausoleum scattered with glass. So if the devil came to claim Jack's um, soul, then mm -hmm. um, he'd prick his feet and wouldn't be able to to snatch him. Oh wow. Um, Unfortunately, none of it's true. Actually, he's oh. <laughs> he, he's buried beneath the floor of a mausoleum. Oh, um, okay. So yeah. these strange legends grew up, but there, there's no truth in them. Ah, uh, yeah. This is yeah. too. We can't resist making up some fun <laughs> things yeah. about yeah. that. Everybody, yeah. make sure you check out his website. You're gonna love his yeah. blog. Yeah. <clears throat> and but then you have was, another one too. Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean yeah, to this was um, something called Egyptomania. So it's like this obsession yeah. for from ancient Egypt, which. Um, it really a went away, really. I mean, there seems to be a new movie called The Mummy every now and then. I mean, you know, yeah. Nicolas Cage has got a, a pyramid tomb for himself. Oh, has he? Down in Nor yeah, down in New yeah, Orleans. Okay. So, I That's mean, there is just, yeah. there is an appeal. There is a, but there, it mm. did really come through in America. There, you can see it in some uh, mm. cemeteries. Real, Even here in Texas, there are some that have Egyptian, I haven't seen pyramids, but I've seen definitely Egyptian symbols and some of that Egyptian, yeah. Yeah. you know, there's a lot of fashion in, in cemeteries, really. <laughs> definitely. Not just the clothes. This one was really interesting too. I was curious yeah. about that yeah. one. So that's in Liverpool. It's uh, oh, the right. pyramid tomb of a guy called uh, William Mackenzie, who was quite a well-known like engineer and contractor who worked on railways and canals. Um, and William Mackenzie in life seems to have been a very kind of upright, hard-working Scottish Presbyterian kind of guy. But these weird legends have attached themselves to him after his death. So hmm. some people say he was a, a gambler. And um, he was playing cards one day with uh, the devil and oh. um, he lost and basically forfeited his his soul. So he's said to be like seated upright in his pyramid, clutching a, a winning hand of cards. <laughs> and as the devil can't beat his cards, he can't claim Mackenzie's soul. You know, um, what's with these yeah. people sitting up? There seems to be a thing about sitting up when you're, when you're in a tomb. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't look like yeah. you could lie down in there. I don't know. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, another legend says he was a body snatcher. So oh. he'd like, dig up corpses in Liverpool and ship them up mm -hmm. uh, the coast to Scottish medical schools. Mm -hmm. um, 
But um, I, I don't think the legends are true. I think he was a pretty straightforward kind of guy. But uh, yeah, when, <laughs> yeah. When, you, when you, you know, I've noticed this when you are buried in a very interesting mausoleum or crypt, yeah. it does yeah. often, those are the ones that, of course, people are going to make up the, the fun urban legends about. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Someone's asking a question here. Is that allowed in UK to build these structures and cemeteries, graveyards? Um, well, um, I guess it was because um, they're, they're in the graveyards today. Um, in modern times, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what would happen now if you went to your local cemetery and said, I want a pyramid tomb. Yeah. Um, it might be a quite a job to persuade them. But in the past, I guess these tended to belong to wealthier people. So they maybe had the wealth and influence to... Mm. Get, get the sort of tomb they wanted um i'm yeah. not sure if you do it now i don't know yeah and same in yeah. america you know the, mm. these were more during the 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 era of the garden cemeteries these really grand sculptural mm. tombs were more although there were some people who caught grief for having egyptian symbols on their mausoleums people would complain that that wasn't christian even though mm. i mean our founding fathers borrowed the obelisk and all you know, incorporated oh, yeah. that Absolutely, i mean yeah. We, yeah. everybody borrows each other's symbols and then applies yeah. it to their thing i mean look at the swastika you know it's been it's, yeah. or, still a hindi symbol but you know yeah. someone else we know borrowed it and ruined it but mm. um yeah so that is interesting something to think about but yeah also here in america though a lot of um the more modern cemeteries are mm. you, they just want to be able to mow it very easily with a lawnmower yeah. so you're not going to get much yeah. you can't even plant trees <laughs> there anymore you know so yeah good 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 question there francisco she's in uh, holland so the netherlands okay i uh, yes we thought we had to talk about more yep. slaves a little bit <laughs> Yep. So um, that's also in Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh, um, ah. same place as where you can see Greyfriars Bobby's um, tombstone. Uh, that's what's called um, a mort safe. So what would happen was um, in the early 1800s, there was a big demand for fresh uh, corpses for medical schools. So, you know, medical science was kind of developing. They needed to dissect bodies. But there'd also been a decline in capital punishment. So there was like a real shortage of corpses. So what, what criminals would tend to do is if they knew there'd been um, a person newly buried, they'd go and try and dig up the body and sell it to a medical school. So um, obviously people didn't want this happening to them or their loved ones. So they came up with all these ideas to try to um, thwart the, the body snatchers. So that's called a mort safe. And... Um, it's um, uh, a sort of heavy cage of like iron and stone. And what they do, they'd like put it on a, a new grave. And some of those metal prongs went down into the earth. And there's sometimes actually like slots in the coffin that the, um, the prongs could kind of slot into. Ooh. And it would make it really hard to, to dig up the, the body. Uh, so they'd keep the mort safe on the grave for a certain amount of time until the body would have decayed beyond the point where it would interest for body snatchers. Then they'd move it and they could hire it out to a different family. Yeah, they could rent yeah. them out. That is something. We rented them out, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. You know, they we don't have a lot of mort safes in America, um, mm. although I have read about practices to dissuade. Uh, I mean, there was some body snatching. Um, mm. And there were even riots at medical colleges at times if they mm. discovered that who, you know, had been dug up. One thing they would do here is they would... Um, layer the uh when they bury them they would layer it with straw and different things to make it hard really mm. hard to dig up just yeah. different things so yeah. it's just something thank goodness we don't really have to think about that so much now <laughs> but yeah those those are really interesting another reason i want to go to scotland okay let's see here mysterious crypt secret mm -hmm. tunnels and macabre effigies haha <laughs> let's see here what do we have oh this story behind this i think was really interesting i saw this um and i was yeah. curious so that's um, the crypt of a church called um, Christ Church Spitalfields. So um, that's quite a well-known church in London. It's um, it was in the built market, by Spitalfields Market. That's it. Yeah, it's just opposite the market. Yeah, Ooh, okay. yeah. So it was um, it was built by a guy called um, Nicholas Hawksmoor, who there's all kinds of like legends about and things like oh. that. <laughs> um, but this this crypt um, had about um, two thousand bodies in it. And uh, in the 1980s, they they kind of basically took out all the bodies. And there was a massive study done by archaeologists and anthropologists about kind of funeral practices and things like this. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's a right, really big study. And uh, now um, the crypt is a, a cafe, I think. So oh, really? You can go oh, down into a crypt. There. Oh, your, how neat! Have your latte or cappuccino. Yeah. Or whatever. Uh, yeah. But th this is this picture is actually from the Second World War. So a part of a crypt is being used as an air raid shelter. Yeah. So like during the so, blitz, and people would go yeah. and hide in the crypt. So quite quite a few London churches, people would shelter in the crypts during the uh, air raids. It makes total yeah. sense. For some reason, I didn't yeah. know that, though, <laughs> yeah. until I read your book. So I was like, oh, yeah, it totally seems like a no-brainer, but mm -hmm. I just had never thought of that. And here's just, this is like, wow, yeah. <laughs> the filing system. This is yeah, really yeah, funny. yeah. That's um, um, in St. Leonard's Church in a place called Hythe in Kent in the southeast of England. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it contains what's believed to be Britain's uh, biggest and best preserved ensemble of ancient skulls and bones wow so um it's like a sort of underground ossuary mm -hmm. and uh they've like done studies of like some of the skulls and found things like um some of them were like assaulted with daggers and swords and stones oh. some of them yeah. had um a kind of primitive surgery performed on them called oh, yeah. uh, uh Tree panning, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. they would like, they'd like bore a hole in the skull to really. I always like, say, I always, or whatever. yeah. One of my life mottos: I need trepanism, like I need a hole in the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, some show iron deficiency. Um, oh. Some also show different origins as well. So oh. Hive was like a, a port. So mm -hmm. there's like schools from Italy and Scandinavia, and even a few from Africa. So. Oh, that's uh, really neat. Yeah. Wow. A lot of a lot of information there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, they seem the same at a glance, but then they can that's right can study yeah. them and look, find look out more. Yeah, mm -hmm. Get, yeah. yeah, pretty fascinating. Oh, okay. Let's see what else we have here. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Just look at that again. I just was like, wow. Imagine walking down that. It's like a library yeah. only. It's different. that's um, that's another famous um, mm -hmm. bone crypt. That's in a place called uh, Rothwell in Northamptonshire. Oh, okay. Kind of middle middle-ish of England, and uh, apparently that one was kind of forgotten about for years. Ooh. But oh, one yeah, day, this one. oh yeah, yeah, this yeah. One. yeah, yeah. One, one day, um, a grave digger kind of uh, fell into it, and he fell through like four meters of utter darkness and sort of landed landed on all these bones. Ah, uh, and, like um, and um, the experience was so traumatic it it basically sent him crazy, and he never recovered his sanity. Wow. But um, that's got like, um, I think, bones from like the 13th to 17th century in there. Yeah, that um, would be quite the startling thing to just fall through and land in this. I mean, yeah, just like yeah. out of the, the blue. Yeah. yeah, real yeah. nightmare. But you can, um, I mean, maybe not now with kind of COVID, but you can actually yeah. at certain times go and look at this, mm -hmm. this uh, crypt and also the one in Hive in Kent as well. They are open to the public sometimes. Um, I don't know why I wasn't aware yeah. of all the crypts and ossuaries in, in Britain. I don't know. I just, you always yeah, hear yeah. about the ones elsewhere. Like we had someone yeah. on talking about the church in, in Prague that had all the bones and everything. And yeah. and I, I don't know, just was not aware. I think they're a bit more unusual in, in Britain. There aren't so many. Oh. Um, but they, those two are probably the most famous. Yeah. Well, they're very yeah. intriguing. That poor that poor grave digger, though. <laughs> That's what yeah. I read that. I was yeah. like, oh, how sad. Now, let's see, you have another section where you to Holy Wells, Sacred yeah. Eels. I was like, Sacred Eels? You had made Sacred Eels and Saint Skulls <laughs> and Skulls. Yeah. All right, this the water looks pretty. Uh, I hope it's for mineral content. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't tell how it smells. Yeah. I'm just I'm presuming. Mm. Yep. Yeah, that's... um. um uh, a holy well in um, a place which is also called Holy Well in oh, um, the Lynch, name. <laughs> Lynchew in Wales. Yeah, it's named after a saint called Saint uh, Winifred, I believe. Oh. And uh, basically, um, she was being pursued by um, a suitor, a prince, and she, you know, wanted to be a saint, so she was like rejecting his advances. Oh. <laughs> and one day he became so frustrated he actually chopped off her head. Oh, my. And uh, the head fell to the ground. And where it hit the ground, a spring appeared. And um, people soon realized that the, the waters of the spring had healing properties. And it became a holy well. Uh, but the saint was actually okay, because there's another saint nearby called Saint Bueno. Mm -hmm. And he came and like replaced her head on her neck. 
oh. and healed her and she was restored to health except she had a little line on her her neck wow. showing where her, her head had been <laughs> severed but apart from that she was okay <laughs> really yeah. oh my goodness yeah. Oh yeah. my, that reminds me of, well, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Walk Hard. There's a line in there where the kid gets his head chopped off and the doctor says, this is the worst case of someone having their head chopped off I've ever seen. <laughs> anyway, so I just, I kind of was like, yes. Best case? <laughs> <laughs> I know, apparently there is. Now I know okay. the best case. I did not know. <laughs> so, yeah. oh my goodness. Okay, all right. Wow, that's quite a tale. Mm. And then, is this the sacred eels? That's poem? it, yeah. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. I love yeah. this. Story. So that's um, St. That's Sib as well, also in Wales. And um, in the Middle Ages, apparently there used to be a, a sacred eel that lived in that well. So if you if you went to the well and you wanted to cure your disease, mm -hmm. um, if you stood in the well and the eel kind of wrapped itself around your, your legs, it was a sign you were going to get better. Wow. If the eel didn't wrap itself around your legs, it meant you probably wouldn't get better. So, you, so um, whether you had it, it all depended on your eel appeal. That's right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I just wonder yeah. how that started. I maybe someone just stuck their foot in there, an eel wrapped around it. They got better. They just connected. I mean, that maybe, is just that yeah. is so unusual. I just had never heard yeah. of heal, healing eels. I love it though. <laughs> I mean, eels don't get a lot of uh, ah, press. People are usually no. kind of freaked no. out no. by them. I, I don't know. So <laughs> I thought, like the idea that there's sacred <laughs> eels, and I, I don't know. I just yeah, sacred eel. Um, now, this one was weird. Is this the one where, yeah, the corpses would turn into stone? No, not that one. Oh, um, not this one? Oh, okay, wrong one, everybody. I should delete but, that. But um, that's, inter that's quite <laughs> there interesting we go. as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a well in um, a place called Binsey in Oxfordshire, mm -hmm. near near the city of Oxford. Oh, okay. And um, there, again, there was a, a saint who was being pursued by um, a king, the king of Mercia, and oh. he wouldn't stop pursuing her until God lost patience and actually struck the guy blind. Oh. And this uh, saint, uh, I think it was St. Friedwide, um, she prayed for him and mm -hmm. this like spring appeared and he washed his eyes in the spring and his vision was restored. So since then it's been, it's been good for um, eye problems apparently. Oh, go there for, yeah. I wonder if they still do. I hear someone saying, sounds like Frankenstein. I think the, oh, the head being put back on probably. And oh yeah. <laughs> wondering if it was an electric eel. <laughs> Not as far as I know. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I don't know that they have them there. Just probably a plain old little yeah. river Welsh river eel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a healing eel. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Um, just want to talk about everything in your book, but I know we didn't have time, so mm. I, you know. Oh, I had to ask about this. Okay, odd artifacts, strange yeah. ceremonies. I just had to ask about the clowns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, once a year in a church in. Um, Haggerston in East mm -hmm. London, there's um, a clown service. Ooh. And uh, the service is in memory of a guy called um, Joseph Grimaldi, oh. who was like a very famous clown and apparently the first clown to use makeup uh, professionally. Uh, so once a year, all the clowns get together and have this kind of service in memory of, um, of Joseph Grimaldi. And then they do some tricks in the church hall afterwards and Things like it seems this. like a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's got to be a yeah. really interesting, jolly energy. I would love to go. I would love to see that. Oh, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, uh, all right. Let's see here. And oh, this was really fascinating. Now, I've never yeah. heard of these maidens' garlands. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, basically, what what used to happen if um, usually this was just women, um, mm -hmm. if you were a, a woman and you died a virgin. Mm -hmm. you were um, allowed one of these garlands. So uh, they were made of kind of ribbons and rosettes and mm -hmm. things like this on a sort of paper frame. And um, it would be paraded in front of your coffin or maybe put on your coffin. And um, after I've a heard few of special bouquets here in America for the similar reasons, but I'd never seen yeah. anything like this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and after the funeral service, they'd be hung up in the church where they'd tend oh. to stay. Unless wow. um, someone found out that you weren't quite as virtuous as had been oh. assumed, and oh. then, <laughs> then it would be taken down. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a dispute. It's hanging there, and it becomes yeah. disputed. Yeah. Boy, that's, um, some people hold a grudge. <laughs> yeah. So, so usually um, they were for female virgins, but Ooh. there is one church where they were for, for male virgins as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. 
Oh, Mark's pointing out that the clown ceremony. Yeah, some people do have oh, a yeah. clown phobia. I, yeah. Yeah, it oh, would be spooky if you don't like clowns. It could be spooky. You come around the corner yeah. and they're all spilling out of the church right at that moment. Yeah. Um, oh, you've seen it on the TV in a documentary about clowns. Oh, all right. Well, cool. I It was yeah. news to me. Yeah. I learned a lot and I'm still learning a lot from your book. Really great book. Uh, now, this is something I just... This is something that's I'm so curious about, like to yeah. see in person. <laughs> yeah, so that's um, um, in a village called um, Abbots Bromley in Staffordshire, kind of like middle west of England. Mm -hmm. And um, each year they have this dance with these uh, horns, and they're actually reindeer horns. Mm -hmm. uh, and the horns date back to about 1065. That is very shape. <laughs> Yeah, they were kept in um, the local church, St. Mm -hmm. Nicholas's Church, to sort of like... Oh, St. Nicholas, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, once a year, they like take the horns out and they perform this dance. And it, it's like, it takes a whole day. They go like all, all around, not only the village, they like go out into the rural areas and around the farms and things like mm -hmm. this and come back into the village and go around all the uh, like houses and pubs. Uh, so it kind of takes a whole day and um, there's like six guys like holding the horns mm -hmm. and there's also like I think um, a maid Marion accompanying them which is actually a cross-dressing guy oh there's wow. um, like a fool a um, couple of musicians hobby horse oh, and they they, oh. they go around like the whole area doing this this dance with the horns and um there's all kinds of theories about what it might be. You know, some people think very it might pagan, be a kind I mean, like, pagan course. survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it might not be, but, but yeah. you know, some people think it's possibly some kind of Celtic or Saxon pagan survival. Mm -hmm. um, some people think it was some kind of assertion of a villager's hunting oh. rights. Oh. By yeah. kind of, you know, gambling around in the forest with the horns. Yeah. They, oh they, they had the right to hunt there. Um, uh -huh. So no, no one really knows, to be honest. I mean, we we know it dates back to the early 1600s at least. The records wow. of it being performed uh, before the Civil War, um, but um, oh. whether it dates back earlier, we we don't know. Yeah, that is really yeah. really neat. I would like to see that. <laughs> that is yeah. really it's on YouTube actually. Um, there's oh. some videos of it on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course. The magic of YouTube. I shall have to. Yeah fall down that little rabbit hole. That is really interesting. It just, it, it just seems so unusual. Um, okay, everybody, as you know, time flies. So Wow, if, already, wow. I know, I'm can just, you believe yeah. it? I know. Yeah. If, if you, I, know, I was afraid I had put too many pictures in. I was like, oh, but there's so much more, everybody. This is tip of the iceberg, what we've been talking about. Y'all need to go get this book. There is a Kindle version as well. Yep. I am happy that I have the physical version because I'm a total bibliophile. But when I come to uh, to England, I'll chase you down and make you sign it. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, everybody, yeah. So, um, oh, hey, Ken. He's saying very interesting, good show. If you have questions for David, now is the time to ask them. And I will give you guys a chance to type your questions. Um, you're going to want to come back next week. Next week, I have two guests. I have Miranda Enzer from Spooky Little Halloween. And I also, which is a wonderful website that celebrates Halloween all year. And I also have a guy who is sent from my newsletter who has sent me a lot of, he does a lot of work um, restoring military headstones. So if you go to just complete strangers, he will just go to into a cemetery and reset those flat markers that get covered by dirt or have tilted over. And so he does a lot of work. So we'll be talking about that kind of restoration. Uh, let's see. Someone's just wanted to say hi. Definitely want to read the book. Yeah, you guys, I this is just the type of stuff we talk about here, you know, in between my show and you want to <laughs> have something, then you're going to want to read this book. And, and like I said, there is a, uh, the link is down in the, if I can find the right thing. I keep clicking on the wrong stuff over here. Yes, it's in. So there's a link to, if you want to find out more about his book, it's in the description box below. He has a, a really great newsletter too. You want to sign up for his newsletter. Let me see. Oh, here. What is the most unusual thing you have come across? This is a very hard question to answer, I can imagine. Yeah. 
think it comes yeah. across so much. Um, yeah, the, the book's full of really strange stuff. Um, yeah, one, one, that's, one especially unusual thing is there's a church down in uh, Surrey in the southeast of England, uh, which contains um, what's thought to be a witch's cauldron. Oh, um, what? So it's like if you go into the church, there's what looks exactly like a, a witch's cauldron just, just really? like sitting in the church. And oh um, some some people say it was um, the property of uh, a local group of fairies. So there are these fairies living inside a hollow hill. Oh, my and goodness. They, they like used to lend this cauldron out to people. <laughs> and one, one guy like failed to give it back. So they kind of magic for cold. Oh, you don't want to you don't want to do that to the fairies. Ooh, yeah, it, it grew legs, it like followed him everywhere, dogged his steps. <laughs> he like fled into a church for sanctuary and the cauldron that's followed what him. What he there. gets. Yeah. Oh, he went into the church. Oh, that's uh, another hilarious. legend says it belonged to a, a local white witch called Mother Ludlam. Oh. And one day the devil tried to steal it and um she um like chased him on her broomstick and managed to get it back <laughs> and Put it in the church for safekeeping. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was yeah. quite um, a tale. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what it was really used for if you want to know. If you want yeah, to just yeah. Them. Oh yeah, go yeah. ahead. So um so it would have actually been used to brew beer in the Middle Ages oh. for um like church festivities and oh, weddings and things okay. like this. Yeah, and somehow, oh, that's good. Yeah. Somehow it stayed in the church and all these legends kind of grew up around it. Those are some fun yeah. legends. Yeah. I've actually got a post about it on the blog. Well. Oh, okay. Yeah, everybody, you're going to yeah. love his blog. You got to get yeah. the book and then the blog. Um, read the blog while you're waiting for the book to arrive. Like, go order the book and then, you know, while it comes, you can read, check out his blog, sign up for his newsletter. Sharice's awesome interview. Thank you. Book looks interesting. It is. It's wonderful. You will love it. Uh, we don't have any good stories like that here. <laughs> Mm. You you do you do you have oh, some wonderful do. stories in America as well. Oh, uh, we do I've written, definitely. I've written blogs about some of them. So yeah, yeah. we do. There's weirdness. Yeah. There's weirdness. Texas, huh? Yeah. Like that's why I say I used to write fiction, but then I moved to Texas, and there's just so much bizarro <laughs> stuff here. I, I haven't had a chance to get back into my fiction. It's like yeah, mm. I don't know when I will. That is fantastic. Love these tales. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, is there any part of you know, how do you find out about these? I guess I'm going to say, like, you're the new ones. Do people send you stuff or do you just, I mean, um, just luck into them? You got a nose for it? I think I found most of it by looking at old kind of, um, well, not not really old, but oldish books of folklore. Ah. So um, a lot of books from, like, the 70s and 80s, which had stuff in dating back oh, earlier, yeah. mm -hmm. um, all kinds of weird legends. So, I mean, e even before... Um, my my editor suggested writing a book. Mm -hmm. I I used to love like looking at these weird books of folklore, and so so I got a lot of it from from those. Yeah, and um, so, some stuff I I just knew from my own personal knowledge. Um, other stuff um, kind of came across on the internet. Of course, you've got to check it out. You've got to check it. Yeah, it, sure. it's, oh yeah, you can't just yeah yeah. You that's just not research it in itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I might I might come across something on the internet for oh that's interesting i'll check it out see if it's mm -hmm. true if it's true it can go in the book you know yeah um, okay. so yeah it's kind of various um various sources really um mm -hmm. probably mostly books mostly folklore books so I, I got it from yeah um what do you have coming next what are you working on now or can you talk about it um yeah i'm working on a book of um short stories that i'd mm. like to give away to people who sign up for my newsletter Oh, all right. So, oh. um, so yeah, that, that's like my main focus right now. Oh, Try and get okay. this book of short stories out, and yeah, people can get it for free, and then you know, they might you be lure them in in my <laughs> other books. Um, I've got a novel as well. Um, yeah, feel free to tell us interested. all about you. Yes. Come yeah. On. So the novel's called um, "The Standing Water," a very dark book full of mm -hmm. folklore and the Gothic and. You know, uh, it's sort of being described as Edgar Allan Poe meets Gabriel Garcia Marquez. That's wow, sort of the, the gothic I, two of my favorites. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, but not. Out, I mean, yeah. but different. I guess yeah. I'm going to have to read your uh, book now. <laughs> I haven't yeah. read that one. <laughs> so um, the the short stories, I guess, in a maybe fairly similar vein. You know, kind mm -hmm. of a lot of. Well, a lot of stuff, some stuff about churches and graveyards. Um, oh, shocker. <laughs> about um, 
folklore, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of lot of stuff about death and all these cheerful mm-hmm. topics. Yeah. And, oh yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at, look so, at all right. It's all up. Everyone here. Can, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so okay. so I'm, I'm kind of working on that now and hopefully get it up as soon as possible and people can, you know, download it for free. Yeah. Oh, well, that sounds really great. Wow. Well, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I, I look forward to all your upcoming projects and, um, you know, if you ever want to be on the show again, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> just yeah. the good old topics. Now, does anyone have any more questions before we let him go? We've kept him up late. You know, it's a lot later <laughs> over there. He's across the pond. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of my bedtime, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, we'll let you we'll let you wind no, no, down. The- <laughs> <laughs> I'm still happy to answer questions if anyone has any. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm just so glad that uh, mm. Stephanie quick told me about your blog and then I, um, and that you agreed to be on the show and uh, that this arrived in time for the show, which was yep. great. But um, people, this is also available on Kindle. So don't be, if you're not like a physical book reader, um, I do a lot of reading on my Kindle as well. Mm. So, mm. so that's just nice, but hey, it's a very good book. All right. Well then, uh, everybody remember, I'm going to put your, there are links that you want to, you need to check out after this. Make sure you check out, oops, I, something, I keep saying oops, because I just keep hitting buttons, hoping that I'll hit the right one. Make sure you check out his blog, sign up for his newsletter, even before his new free book comes out. Uh, just check him out. Okay, everybody, I we will see you next week. And I want to say thank you so much to David for staying up late and telling us about all these great stuff. Like yeah, I said, many, many there's so much for more in the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Okay. Bye.